Hi everyone, welcome to Strategies and Best Practices for Virtualizing SQL Server. Welcome to the presentation. Uh, let's go ahead and start. A, a brief introduction from my co-host and my guest today. Uh, we'll follow that up with a commercial interruption about what we do at SQL Century, and then we'll spend the rest of the session talking about virtualization, things that we can do to make it perform really, really well. All right, so let's go ahead and introduce my longtime friend, Microsoft SQL Server MVP and expert on many of the hardest things to master in the SQL Server stack, things like storage and virtualization, David Klee. David, why don't you take a moment and introduce yourself to the audience. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is David Klee. I'm lucky enough to be a, both a Microsoft MVP and a VMware V expert. I've been a computer geek uh, since well before it was socially acceptable. And uh, about three years ago, I started my own company called Heraflux Technologies, where we focus on how infrastructure and data converge and all the crazy challenges that come about from that. That's some cool stuff, folks. If you haven't ever looked at David's writing, I encourage you to read his material. It's some of the best in the business. Very much worth your time. Awesome. Thank you. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's all true, <laughs> and I'm not exaggerating any of it. All right, let's talk to Jason Hall for a moment. Jason, hi, good morning. Hi, Kevin. Where'd you get that picture? <laughs> hmm, somewhere at sea. I can see that out the window there. So where is that? Uh, I think that was a uh, picture that David snuck on the recent SQL cruise that, that we both attended. I would like to add that I did not eat all of those nachos. <laughs> <laughs> it's simply camera perspective. I can vouch for that. <laughs> My name is Jason Hall. I'm the director of product management at SQL Sentry. I can be reached uh, via Twitter at SQL Source. Well, it's fine. If you use SQL Server, you may want to look at SQL Sentry. That's our mission statement is to optimize SQL Server performance everywhere. And again, Jason is, is being modest. He is the program and product director of our various products and the, the trail boss for what shows up in the products. And an all around great guy. So yeah, I can... all around great guy. Uh, thanks guys. I, I can definitely say that I'm both honored and humbled by uh, doing this recording with both of you, both people I've looked up to for a long time and consider great friends. All right, so we have to pay the mortgage, right? Let me tell you a few things about SQL Century. The first thing is, I'd like to give away some stuff. We have put together a series of ebooks, and these aren't just little 30 page pamphlet sort of ebooks, these are massive. The smallest is over 300 pages long, and they're written by some of the best known experts in the industry. We need to get your name on here, David, in several of these ebooks. Well, let me know. Too. Very good. The ebooks can be purchased in the Kindle bookstore, $10 each. However, if you would like to have them. We now have five at the moment. So just take a moment and go to sqlcentury.com slash ebooks and request the download code and you can get all of those as soon as you finish filling out the form right away. Also, let's take a moment and just give you an overview of all of the kind of community oriented things that SQL Century does. I'm gonna go quickly here, but the idea is we're very active in print on sqlperformance.com as well as at blogs.sqlcentury.com. We have lots of videos. The recording for this video will be on SQL Century TV within 10 business days after the broadcast. And then our most popular product is called Plan Explorer. And it is incredibly popular. And I also like to brag about the fact that it's so free we don't even ask for your email address. There's no reason not to download and use this incredibly valuable query tuning product because you're not going to get spammed. We're not going to send you junk mail constantly. We're not that kind of company in the first place, but uh, you're not on somebody's list. So go ahead and use it today. It will definitely improve your ability to get query tuning done quickly and effectively. The third party perspective, you should get on their list. You know, they're not going to spam you very much uh, if you get on the list. And this is so you can get updates, things like that. And this is third party perspective. I love their stuff. Oh, thank you, David. You know, we were all DBAs and data professionals in our previous lives. And so when this company came together, they decided uh, we're going to treat people the way we wanted to be treated, which is not to spam and not to get into your face, but just to inform. Just a quick word on the products by SQL Century. Our flagship monitoring and alerting product, SQL Century Performance Advisor, it's both the deepest and broadest monitoring and alerting product out there for SQL Server today. It covers more areas of SQL Server than anyone else, and it goes deeper into SQL Server than anyone else. 
As we mentioned, Plan Explorer is the query tuning product, which we also have in a professional edition with a whole host of additional features. We have Event Manager, which tells you all about what is happening inside of your SQL Server environment in a very graphic and easy to understand Outlook sort of style, as you can see here in the, in the image. And then finally, we have Fragmentation Manager, which is added into Performance Advisor. What it does is it tells you all about your indexes, their fragmentation, their statistics, and such. And it actually will perform the scheduled defragmentation of, of index as well. Oh, right. Thank you. Uh, and I should point out that you can get any of these in a long-term free trial if you'd like to give them a try. Just talk to Sales Engineering at SQLCentury.com, or you could contact Sales at SQLCentury.com, or just go to the website and download it right there. All right, so let's talk about virtualization. So what is it? Um, hopefully you haven't been living under a rock. <laughs> I would say it's more common now than unvirtualized system. Guys, would you agree with that? So I would claim virtualization of your mission-critical systems, especially with SQL Server now, is an assumption rather than a talking point or a project. Uh, there's still a lot of machines out there that are left to be virtualized or where the business is nervous about doing it. But the assumption is, in my opinion, the assumption is that it should be virt virtual. And I firmly believe that virtualization is here to stay. It should be used everywhere. The technology is solid, it's ready, and it can power everything. As a, in, in product management, we do a lot of analysis on the market data. And one of the, uh, the interesting metrics that is out there now is that somewhere around 80% of servers in general are now virtual servers. Wow. And it, it makes sense. You know, when I started my career back in the mid 80s, gosh, 30 years ago, the mainframe was a virtualized machine, and so it would have multiple instances of the, the mainframe itself in a virtual sense running inside of uh, this $2 million piece of equipment. As time has advanced, we've been able to build much more powerful computers that can do a whole lot more work in a very small form factor, and what is old is new again. And so now we're able to successfully virtualize many machines and put them inside of one appliance, you know, one piece of hardware. So it's now the norm. Let's talk a little bit about the pros and cons of it. If, if you're still considering it, or maybe you've only done it for one or two systems, there's a lot of reasons to move to virtualization and very few drawbacks. Many of the drawbacks have to do with the amount of education you have around virtualization. So yes. I'll throw this out to you guys. What's one of your experiences of a benefit that really made virtualization worth it? Consolidation, first and foremost. Uh, this was the biggest draw for people to get into virtualizing things to begin with. Um, you know, there was one environment that we were at. This company built a massive data center in a brand new building, moved everything into it, and then virtualized everything. Mm. The problem there was they had a little porthole on the window, and they virtualized. It was about 40,000 square feet of what was used for equipment down to about 4,000. It basically covered one half of one of the back walls. That was it. So this huge empty room. And a little while later, one of their investors walked by and looked through the doorway and got really upset. He said, why did we just build this huge space and now you're not going to use it? So you need to put all this stuff back so we can actually you know, show that we're getting our money's worth. So over a weekend, we moved the racks back in there and strung Christmas lights in them. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. From, from the doorway, you couldn't tell, but it worked. Uh, you know, and basically, that's one of the benefits. We were able to take an entire huge room right. and consolidate them into about a tenth of the footprint. So power, cooling, space, networking, cables, the warranty on just the hardware alone, all that dropped dramatically. Sure, sure, of course. My experience, the one that kind of turned me around, on virtualization was back in oh, it was back in the hurricane days of one of the big hurricanes maybe it was Katrina and a friend of mine was the the head DBA for a energy company in Houston and they weren't sure where the hurricane was headed at the time and he didn't have a, a lot of money didn't have a lot of uh, equipment they didn't have a failover disaster recovery site for their data center so he went through and before there was any threat of danger he uh, did a 
physical to virtual copy, put it all on a couple hard disks, threw them into a briefcase, got in his car and drove from Houston up to Oklahoma City. In case there was a massive outage, he could actually bring up the entire data center as virtual machines from another location. And I didn't know much about virtualization at the time. This was still in the aughts, you know, it was 2008 or something like that. And um, so I asked him, I was like, was that hard to do? He's like, no, it wasn't hard at all to do. Things will be slower when I bring it back up because I don't have the same hardware, but I could even do this on the fly if I needed to. If I was in the office under regular circumstances, I could bring uh, a new virtual copy of one server up and bring the other one down and do some maintenance if I need. I, I thought, wow, that's pretty amazing. I never knew I could do that. Another large benefit that you have uh, listed there is testing and QA. I'll go ahead and extend that and say uh, dev and testing. As a developer myself, going going back years, you know, before we had virtual environments, to get a, 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 dev, a development system or, or staging or QA system set up, it was a uh, it was an ordeal. And now I can run a script and and spin up thirty of them in five minutes. Right. I'll even extend that to production. You know, from a testing standpoint, uh, how many times have you had to do a production system upgrade and have been really nervous about it? And then you get halfway into the process and it blows up. Right. What I love to do is to carve out a non routable network inside a virtual infrastructure and then hot clone whatever machine you want to do work on into the non routable network. Hot clone a domain controller over, and now you have a test copy of production that is not similar. It's not kind of prod. It is prod. Mm -hmm. And now you can test. You can go through the entire process end to end, validate whatever you need. It's in this isolated sandbox compartmentalized network, and it can't get out. So you don't have to worry about impacting production. But now you can walk through the entire process, start to finish, document everything that you do. And you know, you know, if you're going to get a gotcha in the prod process, you know how to prevent it from happening on the production side. Wow. You know, and going back to your point, Jason, one of the things I was, one of those aha moments I had was around the build out of our test matrices. You know, every time Microsoft releases a new OS, we have to now test for new regressions and things like that. And if there's a big service pack, you have to test for that. Just because a new OS comes out doesn't mean an old one drops off of support. It was only just recently that SQL Server 2005 finally hit its end of life. So those test matrices were so expensive to maintain back when you had to have a physical machine for each of those. Now uh, you can spin up a new environment with the new OSs, the new versions of SQL Server, and it's, it's not that much more expensive. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to be all unicorns and rainbows. There are some drawbacks. Uh, depending on the, the hypervisor product that you're using, there could be some expense uh, for licensing that. There's some overhead sometimes. There are some administrative and conceptual complexities about these hypervisor products. Anything else that we should mention to make everybody aware of? Yeah, uh, done right. Virtualization is a wonderful thing. Uh, done wrong, it is one of the biggest sources of pain that you'll ever get in your environment. You have to manage the resources properly. The challenges there are really interesting. It's got to be monitored a little bit differently than traditional monitoring is ever done. The biggest thing for me is going to be administration. A lot of times the IT groups operate in silos. Now virtualization throws in a black box in there. So what happens when nothing has changed in your database and the nightly backup takes twice as long mm -hmm. or the index? maintenance or the ATL process, all these things that happen overnight or even in the middle of the day just suddenly start to slow down for no reason. Right. Well, you have to start to look at cause and effect, not just of what happens to your machine, but because this is a shared everything environment, you have to go in and look at what's happening around it. And it's it takes a bit of a shift in the organization to realize that the cause and effect of everything in the environment on each other really does matter. So you have to kind of pay attention to that. Sure. It's that, uh, that noisy neighbor syndrome, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, let's talk about that some more. We do have a slide to talk about monitoring and maintenance. So let's keep that in mind as we move along. Now, if you're planning on a big virtualization rollout, let's talk a little bit about how to plan for that. And David, you've done many of these in your consulting engagements. So 
being the most experienced person at the table, why don't you tell us a little bit about your process and how you might lead a customer through a big planning operation to move data center and consolidate at the same time. What sort of things would you look at there? Oh, I have a lot of fun with this one. Um, this is one of the biggest things that we do is really categorizing and profiling a given workload to see you know, what sort of target environment we should be on, or even if it's already virtual, what sort of resources should it be given? So first of all, I mean, is this a decision system? Is this OLTP? Is this a regular application server? You know, what workload parameters does it really have? And then we go and look at the performance profile, and we'll go profile this for a week, a month, whatever best encompasses all the different workload types that they've got you know, so you may have end-of-month processing. There's usually stuff that goes on over the weekends. And you want to go classify all the stuff. And sometimes you even want to capture the metrics and look at them separately. Because what happens now if I've got one system that's real busy at night and another one that's really busy during the day? Well, these can coexist on the same physical machine just fine. You know, so you take a good look at that and you figure out where do we need to be size-wise can the physical machines that you've got today that are hosting virtualization, can they actually support the workload? Uh, sometimes they can't. You know, I had one environment, they had a 64-core uh, physical machine that they wanted to virtualize in a 24-core virtual host. Eh, mm. Not with the workload that they were under. You know, in some cases, I'd say, yeah, no problem. But this thing was running about 80% busy on 64 physical cores, not inclu including hyperthreading. So wow. that, you know takes a little bit of a uh, little bit a little bit of extra TS, uh, TLC there sure now on top of that now we got to look at SLAs um, the organizational silos there around virtualization versus the data tend to look at things a little differently so what happens when the VM environment claims you don't need clustering or you don't need availability groups because we've got VM high availability well that may or may not be the best for your data uh, you know, VM, HA, you know, be it Hyper-V, VMware, or whatever, uh, that gives you a two to four minute window if a host were to fail for an unplanned outage where the, the VM is down. And I recently did a webinar with somebody for every minute they were down, quarter million dollars. Yeah, you can't have it. And a lot of times the, the infrastructure folks just don't really know just how powerful that amount of downtime is. And that's just for unplanned outages. What about little things like service packs or operating system maintenance, things like that? All that has to happen. And it doesn't matter what VM level HA pollution you've got, that will not protect you from that. It just won't. So SQL server level HA has got to complement VM level HA to really get that SLA back where it needs to be. All right. So what else? What other things are you thinking about when you're looking at one of these big consolidation or virtualization projects? Well, I look to see the the end users, that one bullet point on the slide, that is the single biggest variable in any virtualization initiative. First and foremost, are the users ready to manage these big workloads in a virtual environment? And, you know, I hate to say it, but a lot of times these big initiatives, the biggest challenge is not with the technology. It's actually with the organizational mindset and a lot of the processes that around it. So it's training the, the administrators behind this for what really matters in terms of performance, in terms of monitoring and management, in terms of a lot of the practices and processes that they've got around it. Uh, it's, it's really interesting where backups change, HA changes sometimes, DR definitely changes, uh, just day-to-day -day management, monitoring, change, and it gets really interesting. And then it, it goes in line with the bottom uh, bullet point there, availability and recovery. Um, you know, what matters when it comes to availability, especially around recovery? So the SLAs, the processes, what do they have in place right now? You know, what if you, what if you as a DBA want to use availability groups to replicate data for DR asynchronously? But what if they're already replicating it through SAN level replication or VM level replication? Well, now you're duplicating the data that's moving across the pipe. Yeah. Even just that one little bit may actually clog the pipe between the two sites and cause, you know, essentially delays in the replication. So now you may have just shot your SLA just because you're accidentally moving data twice. Wow. Now, let, 
let me ask you kind of a follow-on question that that what you're talking about brought to mind which was a lot of times in my experience maybe it's just too limited but i find that when people are doing a, a strategy I'm sorry, doing a rollout of virtualization, they're actually also changing something else pretty big at the same time. Like maybe they're buying oh. an all new, you know, SAN appliance. Uh, do you find that happens a lot? Oh yeah. Yeah, a lot of times the virtualization initiative really comes along with a modernization initiative, you know, especially right now with people getting off of SQL Server 2005. Um, so the problem there is they're changing a lot of things. Right. Usually networking speed, SANS, CPU type, operating system, SQL Server version, you know, potentially changing features inside SQL Server like the cardinality estimator or even trying to leverage other things inside the engine like table compression, things like that. And they try to do it all at once. And then something changes with the application either you know, the performance characteristics of it, or, uh, you know, even the way the app is working. Um, you know, I mean, a good example of this is historically storage is the, the biggest bottleneck. So what happens when you put in faster storage? Okay. Well, if storage is no longer the bottleneck, what's the next one? Exactly. We have Just one. find the next we bottleneck, have. right? <laughs> we had one. We went from slow storage and 15% CPU utilization put it on a good hybrid array, immediately 85% CPU consumed. That's not good because uh, now, guess what? That was actually hurting some of the other VMs on the same physical machine. You know, the app was performing a lot better, but we ended up uncovering some scalability limits inside the database layer as a result. Sure. Jason, did you want to add at all to that? Some, something that occurred to me while David was speaking about the, the shift in mindset that both users and administrators have to have to make when you virtualize the environment. Uh, I was remembering uh, I, I was the same way. Right? I was actually talking to David and listening to one of one of his great stories, and that was that was the moment that I learned a CPU bottleneck in a virtual machine can actually be resolved a lot of times by reducing the number of CPUs in the virtual machine. It struck me as odd because you're hardwired to think more is better. Right. But a lot of times, in the case of, of a virtual machine, it's it's about fitting that workload in where it will fit best. It's just an example of of how things are different, and and you have to approach it from a different point of view. Ah, wow, that's that's good information. Let's move on. Let's talk a little bit about some of the issues around staying in license compliance. Uh, you know, licensing is always kind of a black art. What are some of the things that, that we might tell our audience about when thinking about putting a hypervisor in, in play uh, with all of their big important production applications? These are the big ones and everybody hates talking about licensing. Yeah. <laughs> you have to especially when you virtualize. Um, edition matters here. We all know you've got standard edition, you've got enterprise edition, uh, and you know, you've got some other flavors around that. But the majority of this, it's either standard or enterprise. Uh, so you've got three models. You've got per VM CPU, you've got server cal, and then you've got host-based core. No matter what, if you're going to virtualize this stuff, you have to buy software assurance. It gives you VM mobility. It gives you all kinds of flexibility with that. Uh, ideally, if you have the kind of scale where it matters, you should really take a good look at host core based enterprise licensing. Uh, if you've got that kind of scale, there is a good chance where proper consolidation of the licensing and keeping that VM footprint to a minimum can actually save you some money. Sure. Um, you know, biggest challenge there is ensuring that you're in license compliance from a virtual machine standpoint. It's not that bad as long as you really think about it, but you have to involve the infrastructure admins because they may need to carve out separate hardware just for your SQL servers just to limit the licensing footprint. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. From a slightly different point of view, as a software company working on offering compelling license that's that's aware of virtualization, it's one of the things that, that we worked on recently was, was providing licensing based on 
the virtualized environment. And uh, some some of the things that you you end up dealing with is is ensuring that you can provide a uh, solution that helps the customer sort of win financially. Mm. And the reason that that becomes difficult is because there can be so many or there's such a diverse environment on um, a virtual host usually. It's very difficult to come up with a solution that works well in that environment. Mm. I, I think it's very important that everyone kind of think about that, but also provide something that reduces the complexity of licensing and management at the same time and offers as much of a value as you can provide for people that are going that way. I think the most common question I hear about licensing, whether virtualized or not, kind of goes to the last bullet point on the slide is I've got an availability group and all of my secondaries really are just failover. You know, they're just there passive 90% of the time until for some reason I have to roll from the primary to the secondary. What kind of advice could you give to the audience about that sort of situation where we have those passive secondaries? You've got to audit and monitor and the fact that they are pure passive. They're just there for DR. If you can do that, and this includes from the VM level and from inside Windows and SQL Server, if you can do that, then as long as you've got SA, as long as your agreement you know, is, is properly constructed, yeah, you're fine there. But you just have to do the elbow grease to go prove that you're within compliance. Mm. And if you do that up front as part of the design, it makes your life down the road, especially for true ups, so much easier. Gotcha. Yeah, and licensing, especially where we're a very large enterprise, licensing is concerned. It's complicated. Yeah. You know, a, a lot of times the way that you're really going to come out on top is to work with someone like David who spends a lot of time navigating those uh, those roads. It's it's definitely worth it to, to, to engage. Can, yeah, the savings can be tens and tens of thousands of dollars. Yeah. It is definitely worth it. If you have a large environment, I would I would just pay the fee to, to have a, a quick consult on that just to make sure I'm not missing any any glaringly obvious to the experts sort of of options. Because there's so many options. The joke is you you put three Microsoft people into a room for a licensing <laughs> question and you'll get five opinions on how you should do it. So, you know, there's just too many options and it's really worth it to engage with an expert. Okay, good. Let's move along. Where does virtualization hit? It's got a performance hit, right? That's what everybody asks me. They're always saying, oh, I'm, I don't want to pay that overhead. My servers don't perform well enough as it is, and if I get virtualization, it's going to hit me really, really hard. So where's the truth in that statement? Is it <laughs> everywhere that pays the price? What, what happens with virtualization, its overhead, and, and its performance? Fun part here is that you are guaranteed to have overhead in the hypervisor, but these modern hypervisors are so amazingly efficient that if you can feel it, you've done something wrong. It's not the hypervisor itself. I've gone in and I've done a crazy amount of work to go measure the raw performance impact of hypervisor technologies today, and when it's done right, on average, you're between a quarter of 1% up to 5%, depending on your hypervisor, depending on the configuration. Now, this is without the intrusion of background activity in there. But the good thing is you can go measure a lot of this. Uh, so the fun part is, I mean, memory overhead, as long as you don't, you know, over-provision RAM, no memory performance hit. I mean, it's passed through, it just works. CPU, on average, I can measure the impact of this in one to two milliseconds drop over a 20 to 40 second window. I mean, it's nothing. It's yeah. really, really low. Disk I.O., uh, I've gone and done a lot of the benchmarking. On average, you're looking at a 20 to 30 microsecond hit per I.O. Hmm. That's insignificant. And the good thing is driver support, as long as the hardware that you buy is decent and fairly new, the hypervisor is going to support it. The hardware compatibility lists are really good. And as long as you're not trying to put put together your own white box uh, a virtualization host uh, with unsupported equipment, uh, you're generally going to have pretty good success with the hardware. And then as soon as the physical machine hardware is put together right for virtualization, the operating system, it just doesn't matter. VMs can go anywhere. 
Yeah, you know, my experience too on that count has been if you stick with the, the better brands, basically, you know, they are working with virtualization day in and day out. So they keep those drivers up to date. But if you go with older stuff, you know, from back when it was less commonly implemented, or you go with some of the marginal organizations, uh, brands that don't have quite the R&D resources, that's where you find that the drivers can make a huge difference in performance. You know, you were looking at the specs of some kind of disk array, for example, from company B, and the specs look really good, but company A performs so much better, and it comes down to the driver is a lot better. You know, even inside the uh, guest, you know, the network adapter type matters. The disk adapter type really matters. Uh, all things, it's, it's really interesting to watch how they respond and react to the different things under the hood. But your, your VM admin should know how to configure these right. There's a lot of really good best practices guide out there from, from really all the hypervisor uh, right. manufacturers that uh, they do a really good job talking and educating about that. Well, that's a good transition. Let's talk about a couple of, of the top best practices, recommendations, and things like that. Now, these are very universal. They're not restricted to any single one of the vendors. We've already mentioned the importance of drivers. One of the things that has surprised me a lot, David, you, and you've talked about it from time to time in some of the sessions and some of the one-on-one -on -one chats we've had, is how significant your network stuff can be in a situation like that, uh, where you've got a a, you know, big host, lots of guests, and you're, you've got a lot of storage on a SAN or something like that. Is, is that something you might want to talk about a bit? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, the, the network adapters, the device drivers really do matter. I mean, just you know, starting with Hyper-V, uh, Gen 2 VMs, it's more up to date, a lot better performance across the board, and you can measure this really, really easily. Uh, if you're on VMware, the VMX Net 3, the pair of virtual drivers, all these will make a significant difference in performance. If you're on a traditional spindle-based array, the pair of virtual driver for disks will give you about a 12% performance bump. Hmm. If you're on an all-flash array, uh, it's greater than that. And the good thing is this is all free stuff. It's built in. Uh, you, know, you can retrofit stuff that isn't configured with these uh, very easily. Um, easy to do. Now, a common question we get is, do I want to use this ballooning sort of thing, and do I want my disk to be fixed or dynamic, pass-through or not? Can you talk a little bit about those sort of things? Yep. I mean, when it comes to resource overcommit, I'm happy to overcommit CPU as long as you monitor it properly. Mm -hmm. But in terms of memory ballooning, you should never, ever, ever, and I'm going to, I'll do this, you should <laughs> never, <laughs> you, should, you should never overcommit memory when it comes to SQL Server in a VM, period. Now, a lot of people out there, they'll say, oh, well, just disable the balloon driver and it'll never happen. It's like, no, you shouldn't even be in that state to begin with. Mm. If the VM admins know you're, you have the potential to be under memory pressure, they can actually make it where that VM is not susceptible to VM level ballooning. I don't like to disable the balloon driver because there's, you know, if the hypervisor is under extreme pressure from memory, you may have to trigger that as an emergency method. It's one of those you, you probably won't ever, 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 ever see that. But I like to keep the stuff inside the VM as plain Jane as possible. They sure. can do this from outside of the VM. Uh, it's called reserve all guest memory, and you'll never have to deal with ballooning. Now, the pass-through disks on Hyper-V or the raw device maps on VMware, these, it was a best practice for performance a while back. Today, there really is no noticeable performance difference between the two. It's extremely small, and the flexibility you get by leaving these as virtual disks, unless you're doing traditional SQL Server clustering with shared storage. Uh, that, that's kind of where I, I, I draw the line there. Uh, I don't use uh, pass-through or raw device snap disks ever. You really don't have to anymore, and you should never even consider it. Mm -hmm. Got it. Now, from the, uh, the hypervisor role there, um, that's a Hyper-V specific thing. Uh, basically, you can have Windows Server, and then you can enable the Hyper-V role, or you can you can just get the Hyper-V hypervisor itself and install that bare metal, and it's standalone. Shouldn't do anything else. Uh, I generally want 
that. I don't want anything else running on the hypervisor host level itself. Keep that as isolated. Keep that as uh, secure and you know less background activity on there. The more you do with that, the more trouble you're going to get into. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Let's talk a bit about the Boogabear on SQL Server, which is almost always the disk storage subsystem. So there's a lot of bottlenecks there on SQL Server. But now that we have a virtual machine, we have some additional abstraction in there, a new layer of abstraction. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, just like I mentioned a minute ago, we do not want to use, um, we don't want to use the pass-through disks. Now, the dynamic disks in, uh, in Hyper-V or uh, thin provision disks in VMware, a lot of times, you know, if you're on a traditional SAN, uh, I want to pre-provision those up front in their, in their entirety. And that way you don't have to worry about speed. You don't have to worry about getting zeroed out ahead of time. Now, if you're on a, an all flash array, you may want to actually do thin provision. It doesn't matter for performance because the thing is so fast anyway. And the array is actually going to treat it as uh, as thin provisioned because most of those arrays do data deduplication and compression built into it. So it's just more pointers for them to manage. But this means you also have to make sure you don't fill the LUNs, <laughs> which is, uh, you know, it's an operational thing. It's not really a technical thing anymore. Good part is a lot of these things can be, you know, expanded on the fly if you need them. Uh, easy to do. A lot of the pre-provisioned ones, you may have some challenges there, depending on your array, depending on the hypervisor. But a lot of times, you know, the disk layer now, in terms of capacity, is not as big of an issue anymore, uh, just because of the features of the hypervisor. It's always the performance of the array where things get into, get into uh, some challenges. Jason, let's talk a little bit about monitoring best practices. You know, we all have the free native tools built in. We've got... Uh, Perfmon and Windows and so forth. What what can you tell us about that end of things? Because we have to keep an eye on what's happening in our systems. Really, Kevin, there are two angles that you have to approach this from. One is is what you monitor on the hypervisor itself, and the other is what you monitor on the virtual machines. Uh, now, when when we talk about traditional uh, performance counters in Windows. In a lot of cases, those performance counters, when you look at them on the virtual machine, they are not really telling you the whole story, mm. right? So you would you would need to go to the hypervisor to, to understand completely what's happening. At the same time, the virtual machine performance counters are telling you what your application that's running on that virtual machine is experiencing, right? So... It's not that it's misleading you to tell you your application isn't performing or is performing. It is telling you still how the application is performing. What it, what it doesn't necessarily help with is uh, what you should do about it, right? And to find that out, we, we go to the, the hypervisor itself. And um, in particular, uh, for Hyper-V, the, the performance counters that you would normally look at like your um, your processor usage, while while somewhat useful, they're not exactly telling you everything that's that's going on, and and that's what what you're pointing out on this slide, right? We we have some new processor categories uh, like the like the hypervisor, logical processor, the hypervisor, uh, virtual processor category, and the the root virtual processor. Um, the and the root virtual processor is basically the hypervisor uh, itself, right? It's it's kind of it's kind of sectioned off as its as its own um, kind of virtual machine internally to Hyper-V, and and you can see the uh, the performance that that it has taken itself there. Sure. And what about situations where you've got say you've got the hypervisor and let's say it's running four VMs on it, and it turns out that one of those four it, not a SQL server, so the DBAs aren't really looking at it. Let's say, for example, somebody decided to put, I don't know, an exchange server up there, and now that one is very, very busy. It's using a lot of CPU, it's using a lot of I.O. and memory. How would a SQL server DBA, just with the native tools, would they be able to determine that some something else on that hypervisor is giving them the, the shortage in 
resources, or is that just something they'd be left kind of shrugging? Yeah, that, that's actually a, a really good illustration of, of what I was what I was saying a minute ago. That's something they wouldn't be able to see, mm. not not just from the the performance counters that they normally track on a SQL server. Right, I see. Yep. Be able to feel it with stuff running a little slow, but you wouldn't right. have any indication inside SQL Server what was going on. Right. So the DMVs would show that you know now waits are going up and the t transactions are taking longer to finish, but they wouldn't be able to see that this noisy neighbor is the one that's kind of crowding everybody else out. Exactly. Right. And this is why it's so important for administrators, you know, from systems and and DBAs to to work together to to expose that additional layer of information to the to the DBAs. Right. I, I was just about to go there. You know, I know VMware has their vSphere monitoring capabilities, which kind of mm -hmm. gives you an overview of, of what all the, the different guests are up to. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and if or what hypervisor, uh, I'm sorry, if or what Hyper-V might pr provide and, and is there a corollary? So yeah, inside the Hyper-V stack, you've got a number of components inside System Center. You've got SCOM, which gives you a lot of the raw performance data. You've got uh, the System Center Virtual Machine Manager, which gives you a lot of the VM configuration. Uh, it's a little less, um, it's a little less compartmentalized than uh, the VMware counterpart. But uh, all the VM admins need to do is to grant read-only access into the DBA uh, uh, DBA groups and then do a little bit of education for the DBAs to show them where to go, how to get to the raw performance stats and the configuration, and actually give them a little bit of education on how to interpret what they're seeing, mm. you know, both from the VMware side and the Hyper-V side. And if they can do that, it goes a long way because then the DBAs are not going to go to the infrastructure admins with every little, you know, blip in performance there and say, what is this? What is this? You know, they'll be able to sit there and, and see why and how and not just the what, uh, and they'll be able to run a lot of those things for themselves. Got it. Yeah. Okay, that's good to know. Now, let's talk a little bit more about, well, things that we can do to make the attendees' lives easier. So let's take some of this discussion that we've had to demo. So David, what, what do you have to show us today? Yeah, well, I've got a uh, just a basic spreadsheet here that will actually help you do uh, some capacity planning on what you'll need in that physical infrastructure. So let me share my screen here. All right, looks looks nice. Cool. Well, I've just got some basic assumptions here. Uh, so essentially, if you know you go out to CDW or wherever you get your licensing from, you can plop in the price per core, per VM, however you want to do it. Uh, if you're doing VMware, you know there's a there's a cost to that. Hyper-V, you know you may have to add in some system center cost. Uh, but just basic assumptions. Hardware. Here's the server. Your average physical machine today for virtualization is about 20 grand, and that's you know including a decent amount of RAM, things like that. And if you're doing a colo hosting, you know the price per U per server, you know just ballpark five six hundred bucks in there for power, cable, and things like that. We've got a number of assumptions that I like to make. So let's say my average production SQL server across the board for CPUs, and that's you know. Prod, uh, you know, big, small averages. Yeah, now let's that's say, a good yeah. So you know, memory. Let's go 48 gigs. Some will have less. Some will have more. No problem. And then just a ballpark on number of SQL Server virtual machines that you've got. Okay, no big deal. Mm -hmm. Host hardware, two socket, 12 core, normal physical machine. To you, let's say we have 384 gigs of RAM. Now. So this, is, this says VMware, it's really anything virtualization. Um, host RAM usable after failure. What I like to do is to say we have the ability to determine the amount of memory required to have the host VM cluster fail or to even just take one or more of those physical machines out of the pool mm. and we still have the ability, uh, you know, we have the ability to keep all these VMs powered on. Mm -hmm. right. So in this case, we're going to do n plus 1, and we'll say, I want the ability to have no more than 85% consumed of memory per physical machine if we've lost this one host. 
Okay. All right. And now the variable in the spreadsheet comes from what if I'm moving to much faster storage? And based on math and numbers, we can actually cut down the amount of memory on the SQL Server themselves and get the performance out of it. I do this because usually the CPUs on the physical machine are not maxed out, but memory is. That's why we focus in on memory here. Gotcha. Okay, so at 48 gigs of RAM per VM average, blanket assumption, I want to leave 8 gigs for the operating system. So that gives me 40 gigs for the SQL Server buffer pool. Uh, at that 25% reduction, that gives me 28 gigs for the buffer pool or 30% reduction in the buffer pool memory allocation. You know, basic stuff. So now what we do is a little bit of math. And we say same number of VMs. This is with the memory and with that 25% memory reduction. Hmm. So same number of VMs, same number of CPUs. The amount of RAM that we need in aggregate now, 1.2 terabytes versus 900 gigs. That's significant. With the memory reduction, we go from 48 gigs of RAM per VM to 36. Okay? So now, factoring all that in there, the amount of memory that we can use per host, 262 gigs or 245 gigs. Number of VMs per host, 5 to 6. Because the memory footprint went down, we can fit a little more on there. Now, our CPU ratio goes up. We go from 0.8 vCPUs to physical CPUs to 1.0. That's still not bad. Estimated number of hosts, 5 to 4. But since one of those will be dictated and strictly kept as a hot spare, the number of hosts to do core-based licensing goes from 4 to 3. It's pretty cool. Yeah, that's Hard where the big money difference is, right? Uh -huh. Hardware cost, you save 20 grand right there. Colo cost, you save a little bit. If you're doing VMware, you save some licensing there. And now SQL Server cores to license, 96 to 72. Mm -hmm. Boom. Yeah. Look at the amount of money you save. Now, what this also gives you here, based on those blanket assumptions, here's the number of hosts that you need to manage. Not bad. Now, what I also like to do, so let's say that's 806,000 for all of that. Let's go back into the assumption, and let's do 768 gig of RAM right here. If I come back in here, by doubling the amount of RAM on that physical machine, I can actually consolidate and keep that fairly low. Right. It's pretty cool. Now, the interesting thing here is based on that, I've now gotten as small as I can get on that physical footprint. So now what happens if three years from now we go from 25 to 50 SQL Server VMs? If you look at that, you look at the math, now you can start to project. Mm -hmm. That's only one more host that you need in order to double your SQL Server footprint. Nice. Pretty cool. It is very cool. Yeah, because of the nature of a lot of these things, the SQL Server licensing is amongst the, the bigger expense with it. It's usually the SQL Server licensing and the storage now. Um, the physical machines themselves are more of a rounding error at the end of the budget cycle. Um, so that's why I always say max out the RAM on the hosts, get the fastest possible cores, because you're doing SQL Server licensing per physical machine core, most likely. Uh, so if you get the fastest possible cores, you're actually going to benefit more from it from a performance standpoint than going out. You know, if you look here, uh, Intel, I, I think, just released 22 core physical right. upgrades. The challenge there is if you look at the raw performance, they're really not much faster than some of the, the 15 or 18 or even 10 core models. You may actually be able to get faster, core, uh, fa faster cores themselves by dropping the core count. And as a result, the SQL Server is going to benefit. There's less cores to license. I claim that you might be able to do better and save some of that money. In fact, uh, the a blogger known as Glenn Berry, uh, he does some really nice analysis of, of those kind of costs. And one of the things he encourages, to your earlier point about knowing your workloads very well, you know, some workloads are kind of single-threaded. 
and in a situation like that it doesn't help to have more CPUs right because you you want a lower number of cores that are faster and so this is a good example of a situation which going say from you know 12 to 22 cores if you have that single threaded high CPU utilization kind of workload then you would not benefit from that exactly when it comes to CPU architecture I trust his opinion more than I trust most people's fact um, <laughs> You know, the, the insight that he gives on the blog that, that he uh, maintains is incredible. All right, so this helps us with planning. Where can we find this spreadsheet? Uh, I Contact me, and I'd be happy to uh, send that over. Outstanding. We talked about the operational side in our earlier slides. Uh, let me hand the screen over to Jason. Jason, why don't you tell us a little bit about some of the things that SQL Century can do to make our life a lot easier in terms of the monitoring, the noisy neighbor sort of situation perhaps, or some of the other details that you can get out of SQL Century Performance Advisor here. Yeah, we were speaking earlier about, um, about the fact that DBAs need to be able to see what's going on at this virtualization layer. And uh, once, once you've worked with David and, and saved a couple hundred thousand dollars on your virtual environment and you've got everything running, uh, you, you really need to be able to uh, make sure you're getting the performance that uh, you believe you would get. Or, or if you're a DBA and, and uh, you don't administer that environment, uh, you need to be able to ensure that you're getting the performance that you're promised. And when you're not, it's helpful to everybody for you to be able to point at what the problem might be. All right. So in, in SQL Century, we've, we've always monitored uh, SQL servers and we've always monitored SQL servers that were virtual machines. Uh, we wanted to take that a little bit further. And um, the reality is, is we, work, we worked closely with David on this to make sure that we were covering the most relevant and important things that you would want to see hmm. on a virtual host. And we started First of all, getting the environments into SQL Sentry so that you as a DBA can actually see, first of all, that I have this VMware uh, vSphere environment and I can see into the virtual data centers, I can see the clusters and the hosts, and I can see what servers are running at a given time on those hosts. And I can also do the same thing with, with Hyper-V can see all of the, the virtual machines and uh, SQL servers. This one has an analysis services instance on it that are all running under Hyper-V. Now, we took that further and we said we want to be able to monitor the host itself. So this is an ESXi host running in that VMware environment. On the left side of this dashboard, you have metrics that are relevant to the host itself at an aggregate level. And on the right side, we basically repeat those same metric categories, which are network, CPU, system memory, and uh, disk IO. But we break it down by what all of the virtual machines on that host are using, right? Mm. So just at a glance, without knowing anything special about this environment, once I know how this dashboard is split up, I can, I can see one virtual machine that's kind of dominating network, CPU, and memory. I can guess what we've actually done here is we have VMware inception going on where we have VMware running in VMware and that's probably something from the other. Yeah, so that's the ESX high server on the vSphere 5.5 environment. To kind of um, what happens when you Google Google? <laughs> it is, it is, yeah. Another thing that's immediately interesting and, and when we were getting together for this webinar, I, I promised you guys I, I would show you this is that on, on this host, we actually have uh, ready time constantly at about 15% and spiking up to 20%. And this is an important measurement related to CPU sharing on these hosts. And it represents the amount of time that a virtual CPU is, is waiting to get time on a physical CPU. And uh, one of the questions that we get really often, and, and I'm actually going to ask you to answer this, David, because uh, I think it's going to sound a lot more intelligent coming from you, um, <laughs> is if my host is only using 30% of the CPU, then why do I still get this high percentage of, of ready time 
I would think logically that that wouldn't start happening until I run out of CPU. Nope. I, this is a very common misconception, even amongst VM admins, and this is an area where you really got to watch it. Uh, now, it's a lot better than it used to be, but it's still a challenge. Now, let's say this. Let's say my CPU on the physical machine is at 5%, really, really light. And then let's say that it's a two-socket by 10-core physical machine, round numbers. Okay, we got hyper-threading turned on, so we got 40 logical cores. Now, let's say the VM admin has come around and said, well, I'm going to give you a one virtual socket by 31-core virtual machine. And these things happen. Well, the hypervisor now has to juggle where do these things get run? Do we run it on this socket over here? Do we run it on this socket? Okay, well, what happens if it now has to span both? And now what happens if this guy needs memory that's connected to this one? It's a real big challenge. So what you end up with is this juggling match that has to happen within the hypervisor. This is where CPU ready time gets elevated. It's ready to run, but it's still having trouble getting to the physical CPU in order to go actually get it executed. It's tough. You can have, I mean, we had one, the uh, CPUs were at 4% on the physical machine, and the ready times were causing a 25% performance hit to the SQL servers. Wow. So VMs that have been given too many CPUs, and it has to struggle too hard to schedule it. CPU configurations that have been misaligned between the VM and the physical machine, or just too much going on and the queues are just plain stacked up. All these things can matter. And most of the time when the VM admins monitor this stuff, they're only looking at that CPU percentage right there. They're not really looking at these other counters. And this isn't just VMware. Hyper-V's got the same thing. It's called CPU wait time per dispatch. Hmm. Same counter, same meaning. It matters. And this is one of the biggest silent performance killers you're going to get on your virtual SQL servers. Thanks, David. That's a great explanation. All right. What we're looking at here is an ESXi server where you can see on the right side here, looking at the memory and CPU charts. Well, I have several VMs running in this environment. I have one in particular. Is that what each of the colors are there? Yeah, each color represents a virtual machine running in the environment. And if you look as we go down these charts, the colors uh, remain the same for the same VM. So, mm. you know, if I see one that interests me in memory, I can look for that color in, uh, in CPU. And I can always just mouse over any one of the charts to see which one it is. Now, the other thing I can do from here is if I'm monitoring that virtual machine with SQL Sentry, I can simply go to the chart and right click on it. And I think this one is of interest and jump to my VM dashboard so that I can see what performance looks like on that server. And one of the interesting things that we've done once you get to this point is we've taken these same virtual machine or, or same VMware performance metrics and we, we lay them over the relevant performance counter on the dashboard itself. And so we can see both our co-stop and ready time on the CPU dashboard for this VM. If we had ballooning going on, we would see that here. There's a category for that. And we also have, if I, if I had opened this from my regular navigator, I would have VMware VM at the top so that I know it is one in the first place. I also have the host name and the host name is actually a link to take me back to the host. Mm. So, We've done a lot to make navigating between the host and the VM details a lot simpler for the administrator. Yeah, very nice. We also have the same set of functionality for Hyper-V. Basically the same idea. Some, some metrics are a little bit different. We have a different measurement for wait time here, but it basically means the same thing. We're also able to see very large VMs that might be pushing the smaller VMs out in terms of performance. We also have for Hyper-V, it's actually part of Performance Advisor for Windows. So we get our Windows processes there. That's been part of Performance Advisor for Windows for a while. On both host dashboards, we are able to see disk activity, a mainstay of SQL Sentry performance monitoring products for a long time. One of the main differences between VMware and Hyper-V for disk activity and disk space is that for 
VMware, we're looking at the data stores. In this case, you can actually see that we've, we've identified it. This is our, our Tentry storage device. We're able to do some special things when we, when we recognize the storage vendor. For Hyper-V, we have, we have the same thing going on, but this is at the disk subsystem level in Windows rather than shared data stores on VMware. If you've used SQL Sentry before for SQL Server and you've seen the disk activity and disk space views, they're very similar. There's, it's just in a, in a slightly different context. Instead of database files with rounded edges, you'll see virtual machine files with square edges disk space relevant to the virtual machines. We can expand and, and contract those to see how much space our virtual machines are taking up on storage. And uh, we can actually see we've got a virtual machine spanning several different physical disks on this server. Kevin, the, the idea here is that we're expanding the window of what the DBA is able to see in these virtualized environments. You go from this mystery that is this virtual host, and now you can see what you're sharing with, how much uh, of a particular resource is being used by the thing that you're sharing with. You can get a much better picture of overall performance. Great demo, Jason, and also thank you, David. Very informative stuff. Now, just before we go through the summary, Jason, where can our listeners download a free trial? If you just go to www.sqlcentury.com, there are plenty of places you can download from that homepage. There's a big download message right off to the side as you look at, at the entrance. You can go to the product pages and read about them and be able to download a trial from there. It's, uh, it's actually very easy to download a trial. Excellent. Okay, good. So to summarize, you know, there's a lot of benefits these days and very few drawbacks. There are just a few, and most of those are non-technological when it comes to virtualization. Does your team have the skills? Do they have the ability to learn the new techniques, the new technologies, and, and do they have processes that can accommodate them? Do you have a strategy? Have you done some planning? And we've given you a lot of tips about things that you need to consider when you're planning, SLAs, for example, all kinds of things of that nature to make sure that you're walking into this with your eyes wide open. Uh, licensing and support, as we mentioned, uh, David was very direct to point out that in most cases, you're going to want a software assurance agreement. Virtualization for consolidation, that's the number one reason that we're seeing these days. It can really help reduce costs. And again, taking a look at David Klee's spreadsheet there for planning, you can really save a lot of money when you do some consolidation on your servers. You can weigh that against multiple instances, multiple servers. You know, there are pros and cons to that. So how you choose CPUs, for example, if you have single threaded apps or apps that need high CPU throughput, that might be better off with fewer cores, but each of those cores is more quick. And finally, we went through a number of best practices, uh, individual little tips and tricks that can help you, whether you're using a hypervisor from any of the major brands out there. All right, on behalf of everyone here at SQL Century, I want to thank you for your time. I would also like to encourage you to go ahead and send emails to any of us who might have some further help that we can provide for you. David, would you like to offer a final goodbye? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, so again, thanks for having me for this. Uh, I can claim with a straight face that you can virtualize pretty much any SQL Server workload out there. The challenge now is, is the environment ready for it? Are your admins ready for it? And are you willing to make some changes in the practices and processes around it before and after you successfully virtualize it? Outstanding. Jason, some closing words? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just as we know nowadays, pretty much anything can be virtualized and, and perform well, it's even more important than ever to ensure that you're keeping an eye on how things are performing in that environment.
at the same time, I'd like to you know send one more shout out to the uh, to sysadmins. Make sure that you're providing that level of, of visibility into the virtual environment for your database administrators. They do need to be able to see it, and ultimately, it will be of assistance to you if you provide it to them. Indeed. Thanks so much, guys. I know that you have a lot of commitments, so I really appreciate that you carve some time out of your day to spend it with us and look forward to seeing more from you in the future. Thank you. Welcome. Wouldn't miss it. <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. It's been great talking with you guys this morning. Thanks. Thanks.